We all have stories in our life. We all have dark moments. We have passed through in life. Some moments are, you know, moments that when you close your eyes, you really don't want to remember. But some certain things that um, maybe happened at that point just bring solace to you. Today on Against All Odds, we have a young Nigerian lady, Jane, who has had her own fair of life's hard, soft, beautiful, and lovely challenges. It wasn't easy at the beginning, but right now it seems rosy. For those who are just meeting her at this rosy part of her life, would never have imagined that she had passed through the waters, through the valleys, through the darkness, and she never ever imagined that she will pull through to this point she is. But you know something, with God, everything is possible. Right now, my guest is in Poland. Thank God for Zoom. Maybe COVID-19 actually opened our eyes to a lot of things. I'm sitting here in Nigeria and Jane is in Poland and then we're having a session with her on a case of us. Don't go away. We'll be back very shortly with a whole story of Jane's life from her darkest point to her brightest point. My name is Toshima Pais. This is against all odds. Life is a mixture of good, bad, and ugly, and every stage you come across leaves you with a lesson, makes you better or worse. Experience, they say, is the best teacher, but is it really so? Some do not survive experiences, but the few that have survived have the privilege of sharing their stories with those who have ears to hear and learn. Against All Odds crew met with a young woman, Jane, born in Bini City, Edo State, Nigeria, into the family of Mr. and Mrs. H.I.R. or Robato. She is the last child out of eight of her mom, Mrs. Roslyn or Robato, and 16 out of 19 of her dad. Growing up in a polygamous home, Jane didn't get the desired fatherly love and attention she desired. And to make it worse, she lost her dad at a tender age and was sent out to the street with her mom and siblings where they practically grew up in an uncompleted building they knew as home. Jane was raised in struggle and abject poverty. She grew up desperate to make a living for her mom and herself. In the quest to discover an imaginary world of comfort, Jane as a young child grew up desiring love and protection, fell into so many wrong hands in search of love money, shelter, comfort, security, ended up in the camp of prostitutes in Italy and eventually in the hands of three different men who promised her love and protection, but instead left her with a broken heart and pregnancy at every point. The people told me that they are going to take me to Germany to, to pick tomatoes in the, in the farmland or something like that. That since I am I am educated, I can use my education to get a clinic job, all the lies and everything. So I believed them. I was naive. I was desperate. So they took me out of the country. That was not enough. Because before the whole situation, I met a young guy. That's the father of my, my first and the second child. So I got pregnant without even knowing. And I entered a journey to Europe. I think I'm willing to be honest for the first time. 
I was in Lagos with this guy that wants to take me out of the country. And he, he almost got me raped that night, all in the name that he will allow me to join the group that will travel first to Europe. Getting to the airport, we were denied because we are not having our read this thing, which uh, that's international passport with us. So we are denied. After a week again, we tried and I succeeded to get into Italy through Germany. So getting to Germany, the whole story become a dark moment in my life that it, be it begins to unravel that I have entered the wrong vehicle. That is my language when I speak. So I was being taken to Germany and the same night be transported 15 hours to Rome. So it came to my mind and I asked the driver, I said, where are you taking us to? Because we are about five. I said, I know we are in Germany now. So why are you taking me to another place? Italy. I have heard so much about this. All I got is shut up. You don't have a voice here. Just listen to what we are telling you. You are away from your home. You are away from Nigeria. You are here now under the custody of these people that call themselves uh, sponsor. Let me use that language. So I kept quiet. I was like speaking out, but other girls, other ladies or girls, they were really cold. So we entered a filling station and I noticed I began to throw up. Something was not right. I began to throw up. So on getting to, to, to Rome, I they, they introduced me from the hand to hand. It's like, it's a, what do I say, buying and selling. They just hand over, hand over me to a boy or a man that took me to, to, to a place I was supposed to stay under a madame. Let me use that local language. And the other girls, we just, we were separated. I never saw them again. So this is me in a place I called a dreamland, in a place that I promised my mom that I will wipe your tears because I've, I've, I've seen what you've been through. And here I am in a strange country, in a strange house. And the first thing I heard was, welcome to the club. I was shocked. So this madame gave me two days to, to gather myself and pushed me out on the street. I remember I traveled in November, uh, November 1997. She gave me a clothes and the way they designed the clothes and the way they designed the pants, if you know this light thing we normally wear in the cold, they, 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 they just, they open the under of it as a lady, they open it, the under for easy penetration. Let me be really sorry, I don't know. That very moment, I collapsed. My original spirit left me. I was empty. I cried. But I was not allowed to show my emotions. I have been given money to pay, which is $40,000 as that as, as 1997. Plus, you have to pay the house rent to the lady. You ha I have to pay for the feeding, the cleaning, everything. And even the spot, they asked us to stay in the streets of Europe. Could you imagine that? We have to pay tax to the women and not to the government. I was cold. I went anyway. This is my darkest moment. I went to the place. As a young, young, young lady, you understand, I'm young then. I went with them and I saw how these ladies were being used. I cried and I stand my ground. People that know me know I am a strong-willed woman. I am desperate, but at the same time, I like my dignity. I said, I'm not doing it. The queen said, if you don't do it, you will be ready to lose your mom, your sisters, your whole family will be wiped out. It's like a threat. He said, because this woman, they called, they called her name, she, her nickname was Ikebe. In my language, is woman with big booters. She really has the big booters, okay? So because I refused to do what they were doing that first day, not even knowing that I was pregnant already, I would go home, they would not give me food because I did not come with any money. They would lock me out. Only a lady, her name is Antonia, I don't know if she's still alive wherever she is in the world. God will bless her. She will sneak at night and give me some bread to eat. 
she told me she she is here not that she wants to be this but because of what her mother sold their property so she don't have option and i was older than her than to do this but she's afraid that i might lost my life they might kill me so continuously we started the battle i would go i'll come back empty-handed i would go i will not bring anything then the beating physical beating started after the whole two months into the situation I discovered that I missed my period. And this can only be pregnancy because I was young. I was not taking any prevention. So I confided in Antonia. I said, it's like I missed my period. Is there any way to know or hospital? Like we normally go back home in Nigeria, you go to hospital, they test you out. He said the only way is to get a pregnancy test, which she did. And I discovered that I was pregnant. And that gave me the boldness who said, as a tradition of the man, whether you are married or you are not married, as far as you are pregnant, you are not allowed to sleep with other women, uh, sorry, other men. So I stood my ground. I became uh, uh, a threat to everybody in the house. Every, they isolated me, except Antonia. And I took it to myself one day. I went with them to the streets, pretending that I'm going to do this job today. So I just like stay. And a white guy came across and said, I noticed you. She, he was speaking uh, their language, Italian language, which I don't understand. I said, you speak English? He said, yes. He said, I noticed you. Can you come into the car with me? I was willing to go to any length. Why? Because I needed to get away into the police custody where I can't escape. So I told this man the whole story. He was, he has, he had, that, he had, he had a compassionate feeling for me. I don't know why. He's, an, he's a God sent. He took me to the police station and the police told me then that we can't help you. But how we can help you is for you to tell us the address of the place, where the name of the woman, and then you have to go back to the house. The next morning, as early as 5 a.m., there was a heavy distance on the door. As the police banged the door, the whole house, people were flying from the first floor as if nothing would happen. To, to run from police because they will be deported, according to them. They just went to the house, fetch everything, do whatever they want to do. And what really saved me was they found something extra in their house. They found the blood of people being, they, they, they cut people's blood and use cutting wool to dump it and keep it somewhere. People's nails, people's undies, people's hair, a lot in a box and they lock it up. So the police ask them, what is this? no answer. So they break it open and they saw human being possession. It has hair, your nails, your fingernails, the blood. So they took the, the brother and the uh, and the woman, so they took them out and they took everybody to the police station. We have never seen a brave lady like you. What do you want us to do for you? I said, please, if you love me, I promise my mom I will wipe her tears. I lost my dad when I was 15. My mom has nothing. Please, I want to go back to my mom. That is how I get back to Nigeria. Coming back home, so excited that finally, you know, you're going to start your life again and over again. But coming home and meeting the person that you said you are in love or that is in love with you, disappoints you. He wanted me to practically abort this boy. I called my son now. He's 21. And because I came back, and the whole story in Europe and everything cost me about five months before I was able to return back to my country. So uh, uh, he said I should abort this child. He's not ready to be a father. And I was eight months gone. He, pers he persuaded me to do this just seriously. Gave me a very strict option. He said either we cut this baby in your womb to pieces, or we induce you to have this child. I will throw the child away because it's going to be dead anyway. Wow. Those two options. After, after there was 13,000 naira, I told remember, yes, this is big. I said, no. I went home. And but today I'm happy. Let me use that language. My son is alive. He's the only boy I have now with other three girls. So I'm a proud mother. So I'm, I'm happy. I did not abort that child. So she got me, he got me pregnant again for the second child, but under a, a matrimonial, so we, we, we got wedged. We, we settled our differences. When my son was born, I practically moved in with him. 
He promised everything. But his ways, I'm not here to condemn anybody because I have forgiven all of them. And all of them that really hurt me, I have forgiven them. Am I proud to say it? I am a mother of four, a boy and three girls. Two, the first and the senior one is for the same parent. And the two is for a different father. One, one. But the same person that I thought we are going to spend life together with pushed me out again after our wedding, pregnant with a second child, to go into Europe again. This time around, it's not, it's not in a dubious way, let me use that language. It was a, a, it was a connection from my auntie. Let me, I call that person a stranger and a, a, somebody that God sent into my life to keep me alive today so that I can share my story. I refuse. I say, I'm not going. You know what I went through the first trip. I am going to stay here. We are married now. Let me take care of my son and this unborn child. He refused. I became the enemy of the house. I was being treated roughly. And in the process of time, I made up my mind. I was my I made up my mind. I said, God, let your will be done. I don't know why this is happening. Let your will be done. And I left the shore of my country with more than nine months pregnancy, overdue pregnancy. That is how I came to Europe the second time in 2003. And three days later, I was operated in a refugee camp. I gave birth to my girl in a refugee camp. The immigration people, anybody that checked my file, will say, it is not possible. You lie. I said, no, it's my testimony. Those dark moments I passed through was taking me somewhere in life. So I gave birth to this child. And what was the, what was the result? Why, why did they operate me? It was because my placenta was down and the baby was up. It will have little bleeding and maybe that will be the end of my life. Africa, I don't even have the money to go to Antinata. So how will I know? I have to push from home first or whatever they do. The grass is not as green as we perceive it from afar. Traveling abroad for greener pastures has taken so many lives, sentenced some to a life of doom and slavery. There is a local adage I know. Some danced and were given money. Some danced and were beaten. Jane is just few of those who survived the jungle. The second child was like, it was a story. I was practically abandoned in the hospital. And there was no, there was no water, no food, and the first system because I was not able to. Hey, how are you? Are you guys back? Hey, look at me. Oh, I guess. Let's say hello. Hi. Hi, you. How you doing? Hey. How was school today? Hi. Okay. I hope you kept yourself safe. Did you yes. observe social distancing? Yes. <laughs> Those are my lovely girls. They and are so adorable. My telephone, let me do something. So I as I was saying, the the birth of the second the second daughter was like a drama. Let's say like, like a drama. So I I was in the hospital about them. Can you give me a glass of water, please? When I finally got to the refugee camp, I was interviewed for another seven good hours. Seven good hours. Woman that came back from the hospital, an operation bed, holding my child, interviewing me, what brought me out of my country, what I come. It's a testimony. It's a testimony. Why did I come to their country? What am I looking for? What am I running from? It'd be so good. After the birth of my second child, I another place and I entered into another relationship after years back because my, my children, they are five years in Tava. Five years. I don't know how God did it. I don't even want to know, but they are five years older than each other. So I entered into another relationship and this guy happened to be a Muslim. He promised that he would be a Muslim. From you, I went for that. So I said, okay. And I got pregnant the second time, only to discover that he wants me to abort the child. He said, I don't want this child. I am a Muslim. 
my mother wants me to get married to a Muslim like me. She's, I mean, the guy is from Gambia. The man is from Gambia. I said, okay, but you told me you want this child. He said, no. At that moment, I was, I was broken again. So I said, okay, I will keep this child. And she was a child that came to wipe my tears because I was in a camp for so many years, refugee camp for two, seven years of my life with no answer. On my hospital bed, the day I was supposed to be operated, he came to my bed and told me, I am going to give her my soul name. I said, have you changed your mind? He said, yes. I said, why? Said, I don't know. And I was supposed to go into the theater around 4 p.m. in the evening for the operation. And here is this man that walked in by 12, took me out of the hospital to the city hall, very just next to the hospital. And they signed all the papers. And because of that, I was able to have a resident permit. So they gave me five years to start with to stay in their country and take care of this child. I was so excited to start all over again. I was so happy to start all over again. And she was just four and a half. Mm -hmm. Man came into my life, full of promises. That's the little girl you see now, she's seven, full of promises. And she said, this man told me to, to do everything in my power to get pregnant. So I got pregnant again. He told me to go and study nursing. I was taking care of the, in the care home, taking care of the old people, which I am not passionate about. I did it for him. In the middle of my study, just about three months to graduate, he decided to leave. And when he left, I was like, I was left alone again to be a single mother without nobody in my life. And the battle started when I was five months pregnant with my last, this young, last baby. Let me use that language because I'm not going to have anyone anymore. <laughs> I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. So I went to the hospital, they checked me. And the doctor looked, looked at me straight in my face and said, there is something wrong. I said, what do you mean? It says like you have fibroid. I said fibroid, and this, this, I'm just five months pregnant. So they told me to abort that child. That she is going to be handicapped. There is nothing I can do about it unless if I am willing to cope with a handicapped child. I come and say hello. This is Ashley. Say hello. Hello. How are you, <laughs> Ashley? How are you doing? Hi. You're so beautiful. God oh, bless you, okay? <laughs> so, they told me to remove the pregnancy. I called my sister and my sister said, don't do it. I know the test they will take you through can lead to miscarriage, but hold on to your faith. So I went back to the doctor. I said, I'm leaving the child. Let the child be blind, handicapped, not walking, not talking. I will take care of that child. In the process of the operation and the whole thing, I end up, the operation that was supposed to last about three to three and a half hours, what they said, end up almost seven hours. They said they were fighting because the more they pumped blood, the more I was losing blood. When the child came out, she was healthy. She was not a handicap at all. In fact, she's the smartest in the house. <laughs> she wants to dominate everyone in the house, but it doesn't happen with African mothers, so. <laughs> In the process of the whole operation and everything, I lost my womb today because of this child. They have to save my life. They remove the womb, which doesn't even bother me because I'm done. I have four already. <laughs> I'm ready to be a grandma anytime they are ready. But in life, there are situations that you will pass through. You think it is witch and wizard or whatever. No. It is God that is taking you past that process to become who you are today. Because if I did not went through that process, I'm a very shy person. People that know me, I don't talk like this. But today, I have I have my own network. I speak for people, I cancel people. I testify from my own self what I've been through. When I decided to forgive those people that have hurt me, I left the bitterness. 
I moved past it just from the advice of a doctor, Marushi, the husband of the pastor. I prayed secretly. Two weeks later, a man walked into my house and he's a white man and looked around and asked me a simple question Are you married? In that anger, I asked, Don't you see? There's no man, there's no male Christian in my world, apart from my brother who is a priest. And today I am um, I am happy, I am married again. And he loves my kids, we share a lot together. He's caring, he wet my tears. We thank God for yes, you. We're happy for yes. you. Thank you, thank you. And this is a story that will really give that broken woman hope for yes. a greater tomorrow. I'm doing media design, so I design websites and different kinds of stuff in web design. Like graphic designer, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> yes. If mommy doesn't have a problem, she's covered. Yes. I just I do my work and I leave the rest for her. That is why I've suffered and <laughs> I've suffered enough for them. Today, Jane is fortunately married to the man of her dreams. A mother of four, a writer, fashion designer, a gospel singer. In her books titled Light Shining Through Darkness and No More Holding Back, she said God had a reason why she passed through the darkness and brought her light to speak out and use her experience to save young girls. I am I am a I have power to conquer. I am a child of I am a divinity. I have power to conquer. I am a child of the most high. It's been an awesome time with Jane on the James Paul voice. People do have stories. In spite of all that happened, she did not lose one minute of have strong realness. But today, Jane is happily married to the man of her dream God has settled down. We pray that that woman out there who has lost hope, hope will be restored back to her. Because that is it all about against all hope. It's to bring hope and inspiration to that downtrodden person who thinks life has ended. No, there's always light at the end of the dark.